welcome to the H Plus Academy. Our topic is AGI, how it got started and key challenges ahead. AGI, as most of you well know, is an acronym for artificial general intelligence. And artificial intelligence is a science. It studies ways to build intelligent programs and machines that can creatively solve problems, which has always been considered a human prerogative. Now, there's a difference between artificial intelligence and narrow AI, but narrow AI is a subset of AI. And then there's that thing called machine learning, which is also a subset. So what is the difference between machine learning and artificial general intelligence is taking us into an entirely different uh, realm of super intelligence understanding. And how do we get there? These are just some of the questions that Peter Voss and Ben Gertzwell are going to parse out for us with their level of remarkable talent and expertise. I'm first going to introduce Ben Gertzel, and then I'll introduce Peter Voss. And then I'll pose a question in which Ben and Peter will both have an opportunity to answer that key question, which forms our round table within a few minutes. So make sure we keep this as cogent as possible because we've got a lot to discuss. And then we have guests in the audience. So let's start with Ben Gertzwald. He leads the Singularity Net Foundation and the Open Cog Foundation, which are very well known. He is a chief scientist of robotics at Hanson Robotics and led the software in developing Sophia Robot and leads the team creating the mind behind the healthcare robot called Grace. Peter Voss founded AIGO and is known for being a remarkable business person with talents as an entrepreneur and an interest in the psychology of the human future. For the past 20 years, his main focus has been on AGI. And in 2009, Peter uh, founded the Smart Action Company, which offers the only automation solution powered by an AGI engine. Both Peter and Ben are scientists, philosophers, and well known for their work in the field of artificial intelligence. Our topic is artificial general intelligence. So we're gonna parse that out first. So Ben, let me turn to you and ask, in your view, how did the term or the phrase AGI come about? And what is the history you have with that? Sure, I mean, the term AGI, I would say was a pretty natural term given that you had artificial intelligence uh, as a term that popped up in the, in the, in the late 50s via uh, processes that, are, that are, are well known from Marvin Minsky and, and, and so forth at Dartmouth. And then general intelligence, the G factor from, from psychology, which is the concept underlying commonplace IQ test. The launch of the term AGI into the sort of public consciousness happened through a book that my longtime colleague Cassio Panashin and I were, were, we were editing a pretty in-depth academic book called Real AI, which would have different chapters by different researchers. And we recruited a bunch of, you know, awesome uh, researchers to contribute chapters, including Peter Vos, including uh, Shane Legg and, and Mark, Marcus Hooter, including uh, Pei Wang. As I recall on an email list, we were tossing around the uh, various possible titles for the book. So we went with uh, with AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, for the title of that book. And then during that same period of time, I started thinking about how do we concentrate more attention on, on this concept, come up with the idea, well, let's launch a conference series, right? Because if you went to typical AI conferences at that time, you couldn't talk about building thinking machines. You couldn't talk about AGI. You could, you could talk about it like at, at the bar over a drink after the conference, but you couldn't, you couldn't talk about it in the regular conference sessions. Let's make our own event where we can at least, you know, publicly and in a group and with students and experienced professionals talk about this thing that, that we're all interested in. I've been working on in our own silos for a while. So we started, we started the AGI conference series with an AGI workshop in Bethesda, Maryland in 2006. Then 2008, we had the first full-on AGI conference at, uh, at University of, uh, in Memphis, I guess. After we did this, we realized a guy named Mark Gubrid had used the term in an essay in like 1997 on the future of, of AI and nano, nanotechnology and various future technologies, and which is 
not at all surprising. <laughs> like I said, it's a natural combination of, of acronyms. And I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be shocked if we found some Russian guy who used it in 1963 or something, right? So, I mean, the, putting together the concatenation of terms is not that hard. It's not that weird or, or, or shocking. I think what, what was more interesting was being able to pump it out into the, into the public consciousness and, and just having people think mm. about, wait a minute, why can't AIs be generally intelligent? What would it mean for AIs to be AIs to be general, generally intelligent? And I think the conference series helped with that. Now it's gone way, way beyond that, that conference series, although the conference still exists and it's still interesting. Thank you, Ben. That was a rich history with, with so much different modalities to it. And I think that that is important in looking at your view and, and, and when you um, were actually putting this together and writing books and putting on conferences so early on. So Peter, whilst you have a, a different background, how is your memory about the beginning of the term, the phrase AGI, how did you come about it? And what were some of your uh, experiences and projects that you actually worked on early on? Um, yeah, you know, uh, thanks, Natasha. Bef before I do that, I just want to thank you for putting this together. And in your honor, <laughs> thank you. Oh, I love I'm it. wearing thank I'm you. wearing the extra P three uh, shirt that you de you, you designed. Uh, <laughs> so um, yes, um, the term AGI. So how I came to be part of the you know the the book that Ben is talking about. Um, is I had been doing my own research and understanding intelligence from you know, many different angles, from philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge, you know, from you know, how children learn, what IQ test measure I was quite involved with, actually developing a new type of um, IQ test or intelligence profile test. And so I had spent quite a number of years uh, studying intelligence, and I was sort of ready to now say, how can we build this? And um, it occurred to me that basically the original dream of AI had been lost, that you know, when the, the original uh, term AI was coined, it was about building thinking machines, machines that can think and learn and reason the way humans do, you know, abstract thinking, problem solving, uh, and of course doing it in, that we can learn to solve many different problems, novel problems, you know, and, and deal with the, the, the fuzziness and ambiguity of the real world. Um, and, you know, of, of course, when the, the, the term was coined originally 60 odd years ago, they thought they could solve this problem within a you know, few months or years. And it turned out to be much, much harder than that, of course. So AI really turned into narrow AI. And I'd like to talk much more about that later on. I don't want to get too bogged down with that. But narrow AI is actually very, very different in, in very profound ways. So... Um, in around about 2001, I started looking for other people who had come to the same conclusion that the time was ripe to go back to the original dream of AI to build thinking machines. And yeah, I came across, you know, uh, Ben and uh, Pei Wang and um, a couple, couple of other, other people, Shane, Shane Leg, um, and I actually started my first AI R&D company, uh, A2I2 Adaptive AI Inc. And Shane actually joined our team at, at, at that point. And then the idea came up, I think Ben came up with the idea to, to, to write a book on this, you know, revival of the idea of, of AI. And um, the three of us, Shane, Ben, and, and myself were basically um, tasked with coming up with a title for the, for the book. And yeah, uh, I think, I can't remember if I came up with real AI, uh, real AI or, um, but, but anyway, real AI, we kind of liked it, but it's too much in your face. Uh, really liked artificial general intelligence because of the little G and you know the, the psychology aspect of it. So yeah, it, it turned out that AGI, artificial general intelligence was the, the, the term we used in 2002 when we really wrote the book, you know, wrote, uh, wrote that original book. And then, you know, Ben's done a terrific job of actually getting the word out there with the conferences. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that the term has become so commonly used. And 
you know, while it's abused in, on Facebook, I now have, I actually have a, a, a group called Real AGI because the term AGI itself has been kind of abused. Um, but by and large, people kind of get the idea when they talk about uh, AGI, they mean, you know, human-like, human-level intelligence and, and beyond. So, yeah, it's fantastic that the term is sort of caught on and, um, and yeah, that, that's, that's sort of the, the, the history of it. You know, I, I love your, your anecdotes in here. And, and this is the beauty of having individuals talk about their experience when the ideas that have become so mainstream and so fluent today were originally developed. And yes, as Ben says, this, the term AGI or artificial general intelligence could have been used by someone in Russia somewhere, or maybe someone in Hong Kong or someone in Australia. But the point is marketing it and getting it out there is something that rewards all of us. How do we inform people as cogently as possible what AGI is and why? There's got to be a better way to get information out there that what we have today is still within the spectrum of narrow AI. So what would you suggest? First, let me ask you, Peter, and then Ben. Yeah, so you, uh, machine learning, deep learning has been so incredibly successful over the last you know, eight, nine years or, or so. And there's a whole generation of computer scientists who are growing up, they don't really even know anything else. And in the, in the general public, uh, it's really when you talk about AI, people think about machine learning, deep learning, big data, statistical approaches. They, they hardly even know that anything else exists. Now, uh, a few years ago, DARPA came up with um, what I think was a nice presentation, a nice way of carving out the space. And they talk about the three waves of AI. And the first wave is what's now called good old fashioned AI. So those would be the, you know, sort of logic based approaches typically. Uh, so Deep Blue would have been a perfect example of that. You know, the world IBM's uh, Deep Blue, the world chess champion. Uh, that was a good example of, uh, of good old fashioned AI. So that, that really dominated the AI space until about let's say about 10 years ago, when they finally figured out how they could use massive amounts of data, massive amounts of computing power to, uh, to, to really move technology forward and solve problems that they couldn't solve before. Um, you know, image recognition, speech recognition improved a lot. And of course, targeted advertising, uh, you know, a trillion dollar uh, business. So uh, that's the second wave of AI is, is basically these statistical uh, big data systems. What DAPA mean by the third wave of AI is really what we mean by AGI. It's, it's very, there's a big, a lot of overlap. A system that can learn on the fly, that can reason, that has, you know, memory, uh, has common sense, can adapt to changing circumstances on the fly, uh, deal, deal with con contradictory uh, data and, and, and all of that. So uh, I would categorize it generally as cognitive architecture approach. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's so much work being done in the field of machine learning, deep learning, that there are there's a certain amount of overlap. Uh, but I think still fundamentally, um, having systems where you have a massive amount of data and you build a model that is essentially static uh, is it, really not the third wave, is really not AGI. So, they are techniques, uh, they're basically techniques that are being used in machine learning that are clearly useful to AI and AGI. But uh, I think to, to believe that that is going to get you to AGI, I, I, I doubt it very much. Thank you. I, th I think that covered it very clearly. Ben, if you'd like to add to that, please do, or I can ask you a different question. I, I think it's it's a it's a fair enough question. Obviously, it's it's one I've uh, I've heard and and thought about before. And I think the the evolution of terminology is one thing, which is an interesting science in itself. And then the the evolution of the the actual work is a, is a different thing because I think that the term AI, as Peter recounted, began began meaning by default building machines that could think like people and, and even more broadly and creatively imaginably than people. And 
this this concept pre-existed the coining of the term AI, right? I mean, you could look, Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics, had the concept of AI without, without the word and a bunch of other things even, even before that. And I think it was a major discovery that you could achieve things like doing you know, algebra and calculus or, or playing chess, that you could do these things without, without human-like general intelligence. Like in the 40s and 50s, people didn't know that. And this was cool, right? It was discovered in the late 1960s. Like, wow, you know, playing checkers for humans seems really hard. Being the world checkers champion, you know, that seems to require a brilliant person. But wait, we can do this just by some simple search algorithm and solving calculus problems. I mean, as a, as a math professor, I bang my head trying to get humans to learn to take derivatives and integrals, right? It's not that easy. Then, okay, integral of the square root of tangent, some algorithm, bing, 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 can figure it out, right? So it's, so the fact that neuro AI exists, we take for granted now, but was pretty amazing when they figured it out in the 60s and, and, and 70s. And yeah, they didn't change the term from AI to something else because it was sort of a gradual, a gradual discovery of how much you could do with these narrow simple algorithms. And machine learning, on the other hand, if you look back in the 70s, tended to mean something drifting further toward AGI, actually. I mean, people talking about machine learning by contrast to expert systems, and they were like, well, these expert systems, like computer algebra systems or something, you just plug in the rules. But what if you have a system that can learn by experience, right? And then that, that was machine learning. But then the term machine learning gradually drifted toward what we think of now as supervised learning, where you're training a system to learn some very narrow class of tasks on some very narrow category of data, but the, the term machine learning originally meant something much broader also. So we see a general pattern here, right? Each, each term winds up meaning something very broad to do with, uh, with you know, the, the mind in general and winds up meaning something quite particular in terms of building, building practical systems with, with very specific purposes. And uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty natural. It's, it's easy, easy to see why it would happen. And I think part of, part of what's going on here, and we can talk about this more as the panel mm -hmm. un, unfolds, is none of these concepts are especially well-defined, right? Like what is, as I've said before, in the term AGI, they're all bad, right? Like they're not really artificial. They're natural physical systems. And I mean, you're, en you're en en engineering them, but they can also be evolving to some extent in various mm -hmm. senses. General, well, we're looking around as general as human beings now. Whether infinitely general intelligence can exist in this physical universe is, is dubious, right? Maybe we can pour it out of the physical universe. But intelligence, again, there's no rigorous definition of intelligence that's broadly accepted. Marcus Hooder has a beautiful math theory of general intelligence which has some strengths and some flaws, and there's many other attempts. In psychology, we can't even measure intelligence across cultures in a, in a compelling way, let alone across species or, or types of physical system, right? So, and I mean, the same with machines, like what's, what's a machine? What's a, what's a nano machine? Or are my cells mm -hmm. nano, nano machines? And what's, what, I mean, what, what is, what's learning really? Like what, we, no one knows where statistics leaves off and machine learning begins or where machine learning leaves off and, and sort of proto AGI begins. So we're, I mean, we're futzing around with a lot of vaguely defined terms. Yeah, but, yeah, but if you go down that, it's, it's not too surprising that they should, should drift with trends in, in society and, and, and funding and memes and all that. Go ahead, Peter, yes. Yeah, but if you, you know, if, if you go down that path of the sort of postmodern deconstructionist and that, that where nothing means anything anymore, you know, or anything goes, uh, then communication breaks down. So I think uh, it's, well, it serves us. Communication does break down. That, that's, yeah. that's well, right. Terrible. So I, I, I think yeah. it, it, it behooves us to, to try and say, this is what we mean by the term, you know, at least within yeah. a given context and a, I mean, a given discussion I I, and, not, I, I, and, and not to give up up front and say, you know, the, the thing could mean anything to anybody and, you know, but let's I talk mean, about I, it anyway. I, I definitely am a, a postmodernist, transhumanist, deconstructionist, reconstructionist, whatever, whatever terms we want. So, I mean, I think none of these terms has any absolute Meaning that doesn't mean they have they have zero meaning. They have meanings that we can 
construct in, in certain contexts and constructing a meaning for AGI in the context of the AI world of the last few decades has been very, has been very productive, right? Which, which you and I have, part, have participated in. I don't, I'm not sure any of these concepts will seem right to us 50 years from now when we're all like up, up, uploaded super AGIs with, with IQs of hundred billion. What do you think is the most direct path to getting to AGI? Is it, now let me just pose a couple of questions that- what, uh, Everyone give uh, Peter uh, all their money. Everyone give Peter all their money. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's the yeah. most direct path. Okay, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. Okay, but let me just ask, do you think that it's essential, if not absolutely necessary? Well, let's forget absolute. We're, you're a postmodernist, so we can't say absolute there. So let's just say, do we need emotion to get to AGI? Is that important for whatever structure exists within? Does it need human-like emotions in order to understand intelligence at the level or beyond human level intelligence? No. Okay, what do you think, Peter? So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. And um, I believe um, emotions, if, if one can put them into roughly two categories, there are what I would call cognitive emotions Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, things like uncertainty uh, or confusion, you know, and, and, and those kinds of things that come up during thought, during reasoning and thinking and, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, through, co through cognition. So th those kinds of emotions have to be represented, have to be part of an architecture that the system, you know, knows when it's confused and can uh, uh, act accordingly. So that's kind of under the rubric of metacognition. Mm -hmm. And th then there are these sort of, um, let's call them reptile brain emotions, you know, that, that are to do with survival and reproduction. Um, and those uh, you you wouldn't want to put into a, into an AGI, um, you know you you know that's basically the the bad parts of of or that civilization tries to bring under control the the urge to rape and pillage you know which we really really don't want. So I don't think you want those kind of emotions inherently built in. Now having said that, an AGI will inherently be able to recognize these emotions, you know such as anger or jealousy or, you know, FOMO, <laughs> um, we'll be able to recognize them and to be able to respond appropriately. But this will be not at the level that it's affecting its own thought process like it does for humans, you know, undermines the thought process, the rational processes. It'll be more like a psychologist might be listening to a patient mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to interpret their emotions and to be able to respond appropriately. So to that extent, uh, AGIs need to be able to understand emotions and, and respond to them. But they also do need to have these metacognitive emotions. Now, whether, whether you should call them emotions in an AI because they're not gonna be embodied, they're not gonna start sweating or, you know, like when we get confused or overloaded, um, you know, we have physiological responses to that as well. So and there's, there's no reason for an AGI to, to have that. Well said, thank you. And Ben, uh, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a question whether any AGI system is going to have some form of emotion. And this brings you down to like, what, 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 what is an emotion, right? I mean, if, if an emotion is a sort of a systemic response pattern to the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of uh, various goals over various periods of times. I mean, if, if you take a more abstract view of, of emotion as you would be led to by certain theories in the cognitive science of emotion, you could argue that even like an automated theorem prover system is gonna have, or a, a, say a self-organizing gas cloud in Jupiter or something, which has nothing to do with humanity, is going to have some sort of systemic response pattern to fulfillment of frustration, which maybe you can analyze as, as a sort of a sort of emotion, right? Now, but if you're talking about human emotions in in particular, say anger, like the emotion if someone frustrates me, I want to beat the hell out of them, or, or 
je jealousy and so forth with the flavor the flavor that humans have them right like say sexual jealousy and emotion people have right like a, does doesn't ai need to have that it doesn't need to have sex organs it doesn't need to be sexually jealous doesn't ai need to want to beat the hell out of people or other creatures to take its stuff and i don't i don't think it has to right so there, there there's clearly a lot of nuance of human emotion that we all feel that is not necessary to achieve massively superhuman levels of problem solving capability. Now, the deeper question is, if we want AIs to fully empathize with people, like then, then to what extent does the AI need to be able to feel this stuff that that people do? And here, here we're in a like Scylla versus Trabidus thing, right? Because we we want we want AIs, we want AGIs to empathize with people as they become more and more generally intelligent because that way their values can co-evolve with, with human values as we go through the singularity and they, they will understand everything we're going through, be able to har harmonize with us. On the other hand, I don't especially want a super powerful AGI mind that experiences you know, anger and jealousy and all these human emotions that, that, that people do. You, you could say, yeah, you want the AGI to have human-like emotions, but like the most, the most evolved, enlightened, you, 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 human beings out there or something or, or you could say well maybe maybe the AGI can run like a VM in its mind and in that virtual machine mm -hmm. it has a sub mind that experiences all these human emotions fully but they don't propagate to its top level goal system right there there actually becomes a lot of subtlety to the question when you dig deeply into it in the context of the full diversity of AGI architectures that are possible. I think that both of you answered the question with with enormous insights. I mean, with the the, the um, cognitive meta apparatus or understanding um, to to better. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just want to uh, make one comment. Anybody interested in this field, there is a, a great book called Effective Computing by Rosalind Picard, MIT. I found that to be uh, a, a really good analysis of, of the subject. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, and Ben, since we're talking about books right now, could you um, type or have someone, someone please, who's in a uh, participant, type in Ben's book, his early book on AGI that Peter also um, contributed to. It'd be good to have that as a reference. Yeah, that should be on, on Amazon. The title was just Artificial General Intelligence and it's okay. from, uh, from Springer. Oh, well, if anybody wants to spend like $175 or something. For, <laughs> or they could just come yeah, to, we, to I, this. I cannot, I cannot advocate <laughs> violating uh, the laws of any jurisdiction, but I, I, I would I would note there are, there are ways to find PDFs on, online and expensive. Yes, also. and and there are yeah. that's, that's true. Yeah. And we also have some of, of your writing at Transhumanist Studies. Uh, but I, I wanted to touch back on on that because I, th I think it's really important. And both of you summarized your views quite um, eloquently on it. That that overlap in some ways. You there's an agreement that the reptilian brain and, and those types of emotions of jealousy and and as Ben says, sexual jealousy or you know, beating someone up. And Peter noted it's you know, nervousness of sweating when you're, you're about ready to give a talk or you're being questioned about your level of integrity or something. Those things are, are not necessary, but rather to understand them. And Peter says um, with a, um, a type of meta um, cognition and Ben referred to um, like a virtual world, you know, as a little uh, subset variable within in the larger um, intelligence mechanism or architecture that is something that could be a channel that could be turned on just to understand and watch and, and maybe uh, develop perceptions. So I, I think that's really um, important to understand. And you touched on something that um, made me think of friendly AI, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So let's stick with something like maybe the, the experiences of, of happiness and, and things like that, which um, are those necessary to have, or maybe just peace of mind and, and a question in the chat is purposefulness. Does AGI need to have a sense of purpose or um, peace of mind? Are these attributes that um, we've tried to struggle getting to as, as humans within the, the confines of our intellectual makeup and, and emotionality. Well, we certainly wanted to have a, a, a purpose and ideally that purpose is to do the things that we want it to do for us, like 
you know, solve all the big problems like aging and, you know, pollution and wealth and governance and, and so on. So that's the purpose it, it should have. And to the extent that it's metacognition, it should not be happy until it has solved these problems for us, but that happiness won't be expressed in any, any way similar to, our, to the way we experience happiness. It's just, it will not have achieved its goal you know, yeah. to the extent and, that it's told. If it did, it would be a, a, you know, um, a bit of a self-centered creature living amongst unhappy people. I mean, it's, you know, very strange to, to think about why importance is placed on that when there's so much grieving. But let me go to something else. What is the most likely way of getting there first? If you could hypothesize on it and use whatever conjecture that, that you are currently thinking about. Now, if you've had decades to think about this, you know, God, maybe this was right, maybe this was wrong. So could you tell us what you think now might be? Yeah, so I think I, I can I can approach that from two different angles. So mm -hmm. one is my own work and the other is a high level view of the, of the field, right? So if you look from a high level view of the field, there's a bunch of different approaches to getting toward AGI that are, are out there now, right? And I, I'd say one, one is deep, deep reinforcement learning plus plus, which is basically take take the stuff that's working best in the sort of big tech mainstream of AI, putting reinforcement learning and deep learning together and try to expand the architecture further toward 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 generality. And I mean, that some teams at, at DeepMind, Facebook and so forth are, are, are working on this with a with a genuine goal to, to create AGI, a, a right? Another, another approach, which is I'd say, <clears throat> further out of the mainstream now is computational neuroscience, right? Like try, try to really simulate the brain and, and then get toward, go toward AGI that way. And you have Andrew Coward, I mean, you, you have Eugene Izhikevich, you have serious researchers working in that, in that direction, although it's not as well resourced as the sort of deep RL plus plus approach. Marcus uh, Hooter, the, the same legs former PhD supervisor and the the developer of the theory of universal AI. I mean, he he came up with a theory of what an infinitely powerful AGI would be like if you had an infinitely powerful computer. And then it's like, how can we approximate that using merely finite systems? And Arthur Franz in, in Ukraine is making some really serious attempts at, 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 at that, right? So these, these are all categories of approaches. Another category of, of approach, I would say, is more of a hybrid integrative approach where you, you're you trying to pragmatically put together a generally intelligent system by combining algorithms and ideas from different paradigms of AI, cognitive science, computer science in a, in, in a way that you have theoretical reasons to believe will get toward, toward AGI, but that uh, incorporates you know, more different ideas than deep reinforcement learning, maybe more parts of cognitive science it doesn't try to follow exactly what what the brain does and th this sort of hybrid or integrative approach is probably an okay description of what peters and my approaches have have in 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 common and i i'd say i've been <clears throat> i mean if my serious answer of what i think is the shortest path to get to agi is is unsurprisingly my own project right so i've, I've been working on <laughs> OpenCog approach to AGI for a while. We're rebuilding OpenCog into a new system called OpenCog Hyperon. And this is not intended to introduce any totally radically new AGI ideas besides the ones I've been writing about for a while. The idea is more to achieve a quantum leap in scalability and usability of the framework underlying it so that we can see a quantum leap in performance. And if you look at what happened in, in deep neural nets and reinforcement learning, I mean, I was I was teaching deep neural nets in the university in the mid nineties, right? Other, others were doing it in the sixties and, and, and seventies. The ideas and algorithms in rough form have been around quite a long time. What enabled deep neural nets to do the amazing things they're doing now was not so much new algorithmic innovations, though there were some, it was, it was, it was primarily you had GPUs, right? And you, you had software tools that allowed you to use this new hardware to, to good effect. So you're able to run the same old algorithms at massively greater scale, which allowed better fine tuning of, of the algorithms, allowed you to feed more data sets into them. So what, what I'm hoping and planning is that the OpenCog Hyperon system will let us do 
similar stuff to what we've been doing in OpenCog for a long time, but at massively greater scale. And you, you will then see much, much greater per performance uh, out of it. And SingularityNet platform that I'm working on in my sort of day job as CEO of SingularityNet will let us run this scaled up OpenCog system decentralized across millions to billions of processors all over the world without needing a central coordinator, which is which is also also quite interesting. And uh, I can, if there's time, we can talk later in this panel about like what AGI ideas are in, in inside OpenCog. I don't want to monopolize things by going in, into that into that right now, but uh, uh, there's quite specific collection of memory memory structures, co cognitive algorithms, learning algorithms that work together in this distributed hypergraph, metagraph knowledge base. We've done a lot of prototyping and I'm hoping we can in the next few years get this system to the scale it needs to really, to really uh, deliver what the promise has been. Thank you, Ben. And let me ask Peter, have you pivoted in your ideas about getting to AGI? Um, no, not, not really at all. There's certainly been some clarity. Um, and, um, you know, as, as you said, we've been working on this for, for many years. And um, I, I think we should uh, actually have, um, we shouldn't be very vague at this point in terms of what we think will get us there, um, hopefully. And I, so I absolutely believe cognitive architecture is the way to go. I think the, the progress we've made, the problems we're seeing and how we can solve them. I think the biggest change from um, the, my, my book chapter, and I actually, uh, it, it was published in Kurt's file. I uh, put the link up. That was my contribution to the book. Um, my original idea was that we would need more robotics, either virtual or real robotics for grounding. And over the years, I've uh, come to the conclusion that we can get away with a lot less grounding and a lot less robotics to, to get to AGI. So, um, you know, I mean, Ben answered the, your, your question right at the beginning of the panel. He said, just give me a lot of money or give my company a lot of money <laughs> to develop it as a, as a fastest, the most direct path to AGI. But, you know, in, in seriousness that uh, I... I'm convinced, it, you know, it's not, I'm not fuzzy about it at all, that we do need a cognitive architecture. And the reason for that, uh, and there, there are two elements, and I, I would like, like us to talk a little, quite a bit more about that. The one element is to build an intelligent system, you have to start off by understanding what intelligence is or what you mean by intelligence. You have to define what are the requirements of intelligence, and I've, I actually have articles uh, on that. What are the absolute requirements you have to have for intelligence? And you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but one of the requirements it has to be able to learn in real time. You know, you, you can't when you come across a problem, and it, it, you know, and and I think Pei Wang has an excellent description of of the that kind of that aspect of intelligence that you have you have to be able to work with limited resources and limited time to be able to to solve a number of novel problems that, that you come across so i think that's an absolute requirement it has to be able to reason about things it has to be able to form abstractions it has to have short-term memory it has to have long-term memory in order to have uh, make contextual decisions so there are all these requirements that are absolute you have to have them to have an intelligent system that has, you know, that would be described as a thinking machine that can think and, and reason the way humans do and solve problems in the real world. Um, for example, if you want an, uh, an AI scientist to work on anti-aging, it would need to have those require it would have those requirements uh, that you know it gets involved in a discussion with somebody to try and solve solve something, a new insight comes along, it might completely change the way you understand something or the way you think about it. So these are absolute requirements of intelligence, of AGI level intelligence or type uh, intelligence. You have to start with that. If you, if you don't start with that, if you start with, hey, we've got a lot of data, we've got some, you know, a lot of, got of a lot of got a lot of computing power and we can you know build these fantastic models that can you know do magical things and against certain benchmarks you're not addressing the problem of agi you have to start with that 
And then you have to say, well, what approaches will allow you to meet these requirements of intelligence? And I believe you come to the conclusion it has to be a cognitive architecture or a third wave of AI, the way DARPA would, would, would explain it. So that, that's, that's sort of you know, why I'm, I'm not at all fuzzy about which approach will work. If you, if, you, if you really pay attention to what intelligence requires, you can eliminate a lot of approaches out of hand. And you have to say, you know, they have to be going down the wrong path. Now, the, the other thing that I'd like to come back to, and maybe if we have time, is the fundamental difference between narrow AI and AGI. There's a very, very fundamental difference in solving one problem at a time or solving the problem of intelligence. And the key difference is that narrow AI, the intelligence does not reside in the AI primarily in the, in the code. The intelligence resides in the programmer. You know, if you look at um, a, a Deep Blue, it was the ingenuity, the intelligence of the, of, the, of the programmers that figured out how they could use computer algorithms and put them together in a certain way and use the, the, the brute force computing power uh, to be able to play a good game of chess. And today, even with um, second wave, you know, statistical deep learning systems, it's a data scientist who decides what data to, to put in, how to label it, what architecture to use, and then find, oh, this didn't quite work. Okay, we'll fiddle it, we'll use a different architecture, we'll train it differently, or we'll add some other algorithm to it. It's again, the intelligence of the, the, the computer science data scientist that is actually solving the problem rather than the intelligence providing with, within the, uh, the code. And that is the fundamental difference between narrow AI and AGI in, in my mind. And again, anybody who is doing narrow AI isn't really working towards the problem of AGI. Well said, Ben, yeah, do you want to comment? Say, yeah, I mean, we're getting, of course, we're touching on a bunch of fairly deep topics here. I think regarding cognitive architectures, I would say there's been two there's, there's many, many threads of development in the AI field over the past decades, right? And one of them, I would say, focused on learning algorithms, including deep learning neural algorithms, including, say, ev ev evolutionary algorithms for, for learning, but better and better algorithms for learning patterns in, in data sets or streams of data. Another focused on cognitive architecture, sort of how it's processing a range. And you had architectures like SOAR and ACTAR coming under that. And to simplify a bit, I think everyone realizes that good learning algorithms are needed and that cognitive architecture, like arrangement of different parts of a, of, of a mind, like perception, action, long-term memory, w w working memory, procedural memory, that cognitive architecture is, is needed. To caricature a bit, I would say, Folks on the learning algorithm side just think once you get the learning algorithms right, it's not that hard to slap a cognitive architecture around it. And folks on the cognitive architecture side, say the guys behind SOAR or ACTAR, the classic cognitive architectures from academic AI, sort of believe if you get the cognitive architecture right and the different parts of the mind and the information flows between them, then sticking some learning algorithms in each box in the cognitive architecture diagram is not not such a big deal. So it's not, it's not so much that anyone thinks you don't need a cognitive architecture or you don't need a good learning algorithm. People differ on like, what's the, what's, what's the hard part, right? And so that, that, I would say clearly the AI field is swung quite far in the direction of just get the learning algorithms, right? And then you can slap the cognitive architecture on top of it. Whereas Peter and I have been a bit more in, in the other direction, like get the, get the architecture right, understand the parts of the mind, how the information flows between them, how this integrated system interacts with an environment to, le to learn by experience, build a model of the world by, by, by experience. And then, then you can upgrade the le learning algorithms in, in different ways to make it, it smarter and smarter. So there, 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 there's, you know, I'm reminded of a, a workshop I did, I think it was 2011 at uh, University of Tennessee, which was, we originally called it the AGI road mapping workshop. And I gathered together a dozen AGI researchers 
more from an academic background in, 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 into the University of Tennessee. It was co-hosted with Itamar, Itamar Arel, right? And it was another AGI researcher who was in academia, went into industry. Now he cashed out of his company. He's an independent AGI researcher, right? But what was interesting is pretty much every researcher in that room agreed on sort of what was the end goal of human level AGI. I mean, not, that's not the end goal of AGI because we all want to create superhuman super intelligence beyond the singularity, but sort of the, the intermediate goal of making a system that's roughly as smart as a person, right? And we could all agree, like, if you could make, for example, a robot that could go to MIT, go, roll into all the classes, listen to the professor, take the exams without, without, without cheating and going on the internet during the exam, right? If you could do exactly what a person did, it's human level general intelligence. If you, if you had an AGI that could do every human job in the current economy with the same instruction on the job that a person has when they start the job, I mean, we all pretty much agreed, yeah, this is a human level AGI. On the other hand, what's the intermediate path to get there? Like what, what steps do we wanna do now to be step one and then two, three, four, five to get to this understood goal? Everyone in the room had a totally different perspective on that. And unsurprisingly, each researcher believed what they were doing was the best first step, right? So, I mean, you had, mm -hmm. you had, you had some people who were ro robotics oriented. I think J Josh Hall was, was, was there, Jay Stores Hall. And he, you know, he, we all agreed on the same end goal, but he was like, but the first thing to solve is getting perception and action integrated in a robot that can like go into a random person's house in America and figure out how to use the coffee machine, right? And so he was just like this, this is the first thing to solve. Then all this more abstract learning and reasoning will fall out of that. Whereas some, some other folks who were working more on natural language processing, they were just like, the first thing we need to solve is get the proto AGI system to read and understand text and map, map the knowledge out of language because language is what makes humans. Yeah, but Ben, than ben dog, we, don't, dog, we, don't, we don't need to be agnostic. We don't need to be agnostic about these things. things. Right? So I guess the point is there were many different paths to AGI being taken seriously by serious researchers in the field. Not coincidentally, each researcher was working hard on what they thought was the hardest part and the best step to 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 achieve first. So we ended up writing a paper out of that workshop called Mapping the Landscape of AGI. We didn't come up with a roadmap. Rather, it was like there's a there's a mountain, the peak is human level AGI. And each of us was looking at different routes up that mountain. Since none of us had an extremely clear view of the top of the mountain, there's some clouds around. We had different ideas of what might be the what might be the most tractable path to get to the top of that mountain. And then, of course, once you get to the top of that mountain, then there then there's the the ladder to infinity, where you can ascend from human level AGI into super intelligence, right? But the the shortest path to the top of the mountain. I mean, I I have my own pretty strongly held views on it, but I have to observe that other AGI researchers who I also respect have their own strongly held views on that. And it is to some extent a matter of research intuition at this point. Let me just ask, when you, uh, Peter, you um, pose the question um, or the statement, um, Ben, um, we don't have to be agnostic about this. Can you explain that a little bit, please? Yeah, I mean, we can have a debate about that. Now, surely, of course, there are people who are so wedded to their ideas that, you know, you can't really debate with them whether in a, you know whether the approach is the right one or the wrong one but certainly one can have these debates and I think for a knowledgeable objective audience they can see and say yes this position makes a lot more sense than another position so for example you know you you, you seem to indicate that the work that's being done in machine learning uh, needs to be done anyway and you know it, it, it's you know we're going to need to plug it into our cognitive architectures at a later stage and no I disagree the work that's being done in, in machine learning is largely wasted because it's it's back propagation it's offline learning it's largely useless to 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 AGI and I think one needs to have these kind of debates or is robotics needed and you know one can debate that is it worth pursuing a path that requires infinite computing power? No, it isn't. You know, so it's it's. I don't think it's it's 
make sense to be agnostic about it and say, well, these are smart people and, you know, therefore I have to kind of almost weigh their, well, the thing their, is, Peter, their proposal I, I, equal, I, equally to, you know, it's just my intuition versus, versus somebody else's well, I, intuition. I think we need to get past just intuition. Well, Peter, I've, I've clearly made my choice of where to put my own attentional yeah. and financial resources, because as one person or as one project, Singularity Net with a limited budget, we just we got you got to make a column on what to do. Like you, you can't you can't you can't do everything, right? On, on the other hand, I think I I fundamentally don't feel the level of confidence that that you do that all these other approaches are, are clearly dead ends. It seems to me quite irrational to have that level of confidence that these things are are dead ends because we're clearly in an area of research which is at, at an at an early at an early stage. And I mean we don't we don't like if 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 for example DeepMind was to add an artificial hippocampus, an artificial basal ganglia, an artificial thalamus to one of their deep deep neural net systems and was to you know, replace back propagation with some sort of decentralized difference target propagation, and then make a real breakthrough toward an artificial toddler. Like I, I think there's maybe a three percent chance that they'll do that, but I don't. I don't think there's a, a zero or point oh 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 one percent chance. Right? I, I think there's still there's still some genuine uncertainty about 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 which approaches can can work and which ones can. And similarly, if you look at Arthur Franz's papers, I mean he's in the last AGI conference, he showed a system which approximates Marcus Hooder's infinite resources AI, but you know learns a whole whole bunch of different neural AI algorithms as a consequence of this single single general intelligence approximation of Hooder's infinite resources AI. Do, do I think that's going to lead to AGI? Probably not. Like I'm not I'm not betting my time or, or money on it, but I. I also don't think it's like a perpetual motion machine where like there's there's no way this can happen or else our whole understanding of the unit of the universe is wrong, right? So I, I think we're we're still we're still feeling our way towards something that none of us fully understands, which is yeah, well, I, I, which, I guess which, it's... Which, is, which is which is fine. And the, the beauty of being near the singularity is the process of feeling our way there is so fucking fast, and we can we can get more and more certain and more and more knowledge each year. So I mean, my, my view is there is still a lot we don't understand, but I still won't be shocked if we get the human level AGI in like four, five, seven years from now, because we're in an era of history where we can just progress super, super fast. Like you, you look at machine vision between 2014 and 17, it went from being like a research pursuit to a dominant feature in world economy, natural language processing between the BERT model coming out in 2017, 18, and and now natural language processing in a few years went from an obscure research area to a major feature in world economy. So I think, you know, in a matter of three or four years, we can see AGI going from being an obscure research area to a major, major feature in the world economy with, with dramatic success. But what, what happened during these three or four year bursts of success in computer vision and natural language processing was a lot of uncertainty was reduced. A lot, a lot, a lot of things were understood that weren't understood in the beginning. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't just engineering according to known principles. But it was discovery. What's, what's so much fun is that we're in a phase where we can make a lot of discoveries so much more rapidly than in earlier parts of our, of our careers. Right? Due to computing and data and critical mass of, of human minds focusing on the problem. Let me ask. Um, let's pivot here just a little bit. Unless Peter, did you want to respond to Ben? Uh, yeah, just a, a quick, uh, yeah, a quick sentence. I mean, yeah, obviously, we uh, we differ in our degree of uh, how we see how much research there needs to be done. You know, you say there's a lot of things we don't understand. I don't really feel that way. And again, I want to point to my comment that I made: is you have to start with understanding what intelligent entails and requires, and then do you basically have a system that um, that delivers these requirements, and uh, I, I, I don't think that any. Well, clearly, that, not I don't think there's a lot of system that delivers the requirements at this point. Yeah. Right? So I mean, the answer is the the, the, the answer is no. no. None of us has 
a complete software system that delivers. No, we don't have the software delivers. system, but yeah. do we do we have a design that meets those requirements? And or are we, you know, I, I mean, you, you see, you clearly feel that we still I, I, very I, much I in think, a research. I think, I, think research I do, phase. but it's not, yeah. not proved. It's not proved until it until it does the thing, right? So I, I believe OpenCog Hyperon design meets the requirements of human level AGI. I assign a pretty high, but not 100% probability to that. And that's, I'm, I'm yeah, working, I, to, I, I, I wish I'm working to increase my probability assignation by completing the system and making it really do the thing, right? So. Yeah, but there's another part and I wish uh, more people would do that. and. I, actually trying to get together a forum like that with people who believe they have a path to AGI, which is actually very, very few people in the world who genuinely, um, you know, believe they have an approach and an architecture that can do it and talk it through and say, okay, what are the unknowns or what, you know, how do you meet these various requirements of, of AGI? And if they don't have answers to them at all, then yeah, it's they're either on the wrong track or they have to go back to the drawing board. But if in principle you have answers to how you're going to meet the requirements of, of AGI, then you, one, you know, one can say, yes, this, this seems like a, a, a viable yeah, path. You can have answers that make sense conceptually and that are not, that are in the suggested by preliminary experiments you've done. But of course, the history of science and engineering it's still full of things that made sense conceptually and were suggested by preliminary experiments and then reality didn't didn't fully, right right fully but then at least we can them. we can I mean, we can yes, do those experiments you know and and yeah, yeah. that's what we're doing right but if somebody that's what, doesn't that's what those of us actually working in the field are doing if somebody doesn't have a roadmap you know i mean most people say uh no we don't have a a, a path to agi a clear path to AGI. I just want to throw in a, a, a brief analogy. Remember in the, many years ago, we used to talk about which will come first, nanotechnology or AI, remember? <laughs> and it was 50-50. AI um, clearly came first. But if we think about uh, Drexler's vision about nanotechnology, which was infused with AI to be sure, and then take a look at a roadmap for Robert Friedis when he wrote Nanomedicine. He actually had a path, a roadmap in building nanorobots. While it was a seminal book, early ideas to worry is now with more applicability, like biocompatibility. Um, if you're going to have a robot in your body, it has to have some kind of roadmap and plan to function well with biology. But I just wanted to toss that out there because I think we could learn a lot from the other fields. Let me go back to, so I remember in my, in my late teens and early 20s, I was, I mean, I was, went through school quickly. I got my bachelor's at 18 and then started my graduate work. But I, I did my PhD in math because I wasn't sure what I wanted to focus on because there were so many interesting things in the world and I figured most of them could use math. So I was going through a, th a process like, okay, what's, what's if, if, if you want to create a singularity what's the what's the best thing to focus on do we do i want to do i want to focus on building nanotechnology do i want to make make myself and others immortal so we have a long time to work on it do i want to make a hyperdrive so i can fly away and come back a million years later after after civilization like cr created super intelligence already do i want to work on brain implants do i want to work on on agi and part of the reason i settled on agi is it seemed like there was a high probability you could do it by just sitting down and typing at the computer, right? And the, the reason I didn't choose nanotech or biotech was nanotech needed fabulously expensive machines to like, to like this stuff Ralph Merkel wants to do with diamondoid nanotech. I mean, it's a lot of custom scanning, tunneling electron microscopes, right? And with longevity research, which I'm still working on or, or brain computer implants, I mean, there's, very valid safety concerns about experimenting on human bodies. I mean, some of these are exaggerated mm -hmm. and, and, and bad, and there's bogus bioethics out there, but, there, yeah. but there's the also- Biocompatibility is a right? science and it's a fact. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I mean, you're yeah. cutting open people's heads and sticking stuff inside. You gotta be a little more careful than unscrewing the, ro the robot head. And, Let and me just switch here. Um, and yeah, so uh, I, I, anyway, I, I think this is, this is why yeah. AGI has, gone faster and, and AI has gone faster and why I think it will 
continue to, and why you can proceed in a more agile way. I mean, so if you're if you're building hardware or you're mucking inside people's brains and bodies, you've really got to. The cost of each step is very large, both in risk and in and in in money. I mean, if you're if you're experimenting with software, in a way you can be much more agile. You can write code. You can you can revise the code. You can delete the hard drive and put new stuff on there. You can you can you can play in a much more exploratory, experimental way. And you're not wasting huge amounts of money. You're risking people's lives at each step along your your research path. And that that's why I chose AI and said these other things in the first place. Yeah. And I think it's why AI has has gone faster. And it's why I think AI will continue to to grow faster in, in, yes. in the coming years. Okay, so AI risks. We've heard a, a lot about existential risks. Let's not go there. But let's talk about AI risks specifically and the alignment or non, non-problem problem. And Peter, what are your views on that? So, yeah, I do believe largely the alignment problem, which dominates the sort of AI risk community, I, th- I believe is a non-problem. Actually, Ben, you you wrote uh, an article quite a few years ago on uh, sort of a similar take. I thought it was you did a a very good job of uh, sort of explaining it. I mean, it sort of basically comes down to, um, you know, if we talk talk about the paper clipper problem, that if the system doesn't properly understand what you actually want done, it will misinterpret your instructions and do something that's completely different to what you wanted to do. So, I mean, my, my core argument, and I think Ben, that sort of was what, what you wrote about, uh, is essentially we are postulating a system that on the one hand is so smart that it can outsmart every defense that we can throw at it, every other AI defense, every other human ingenuity. So it's that super smart. But on the other hand, it's so dumb that it didn't bother to ask why you actually wanted the paper clips or when you wanted to stop making paper clips or you know whatever thing is. So clearly an AI, an AGI that is that smart that can outsmart us uh, must be smart enough to also find out exactly what we want and to discuss with us, well, is that really what you want? Do you have your thoughts through the implications and, and so on? So to me, um, you know, we're not talking about accidental uh, misalignment. That's just you know bad engineering. We, we're talking talking about that. It's supposed to be an inherent problem. Yeah. So Ben, maybe you can expand on from what I remember. I think you. you yeah. Um, you I mean, I that. think first of all, as as will be clear from my earlier comments in this in this panel, I'm, uh, I have a healthy respect for my own ignorance and the <laughs> ignorance of of all humans. So I mean, if if you ask me, can we know for sure that creating human level and superhuman AGI is not dangerous and is going to turn out well? I'd say, like, of, of course we don't. Anyone who tells you, anyone who tells you it's definitely safe is either a liar or an idiot, right? I, I, I mean, we're talking about creating machines at our level than twice, ten, a hundred times smarter than us. So of course we can't know for certain what, what what's what's going to happen, and that. Of course, we don't know for certain what's going to happen on the planet if we don't create AG, AGI either. I mean, we don't know what biopathogens are going to be released, what new weapons are going to be invented. I mean, we're, we're living in a state of fundamental un- uncertainty, and we're not, we're not going to come upon a certainty that, that AGI is safe. On the other hand, the notion put out there, I mean, by Bostrom and Eliezer Yudkowsky and other very smart, you know, good-hearted, well-meaning people, the notion put out there that there's for some reason a high probability that AGI is going to turn out dangerous to people. There's there's no there's no rational foundation for that that I can understand either. And my my big argument against Nick Bostrom's book Super Intelligence about the risks of AGI is that he poses very careful analytical arguments that there's a non-zero chance of AGI killing everyone. And then he makes it sound like he's argued there's a high chance of AGI killing everyone. Mm-hmm. But all he's really argued is like we can't rule out the possibility, which is clearly the case. We can't we can't we can't rule out the possibility. So if if there's a greater than zero chance that AGI will will do bad things to people, and we don't know for sure how high that chance is, I mean, what we can do is figure out pragmatically how to increase the odds that the advent of AGI is is beneficial for for everyone right and that i don't think that 
it's not necessarily very hard in a conceptual sense. It may be hard in a practical sense because it involves human systems and doing even the most basic things in, in collective human systems can, can be very, very hard, right? I mean, I, I, I think, as, as, as Peter said, the, the idea of an AGI that like goes rogue and pursues some stupid goal like to turn the universe into paper clips is just silly. The, the idea that, that a superhuman AGI might not care too much about people is not entirely silly. I mean, many people don't care too much about mm -hmm. squirrels, fish, and, and ants, and ants, and so forth. Yet some people do care a lot about squirrels, fish, fish, and ants, right? But, mm -hmm. I mean, many people don't care about their parents and leave them to rot in an old folks' home. Other people care a lot about their parents and take good care of them in, in, in their old age, right? So, I mean, the question becomes, how could you bias the ethical orientation of the emerging AGI minds in, in a positive direction. And I mean, you need, clearly you need a cognitive architecture, which is capable of compassion and rational positive ethics and cooperation. And then you need to raise up the AGI with this capable cognitive architecture in, 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 in the context where it's, it's learning how to interact positively with people and how to cooperate with people toward towards shared goals. So I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to create AGIs that are obedient to people for the for the long term. I mean, in, in the short run, of, of course, we, we, we want to create AGIs that, that serve our purposes. If AGIs are exceeding human beings massively in general intelligence, I mean, the, the idea that we're going to keep them under our rigorous control seems a bit fanciful to me, but can we grow our own values together with the values of the, of the AGI and some sort of positive and mostly harmonious cooperation. I don't, I don't see why not. I think the, the biggest risk really is that the early stage AGIs are, are developed for the wrong reasons within, within human society and are then filled with the wrong flavor of human value systems. Like if, if the first AGIs were killer robots that were evolved by one nation to slaughter people from another nation, well, that's the bias the early AGI mind has, right? If, if the first AGI's only goal is to convince people to buy crap online that they, that they don't need by brainwashing them, okay, well then maybe you're breeding an AGI whose mindset is one like, how do you, how do you brainwash, brainwash people to achieve your own ends, right? So we, there's, building a cognitive architecture capable of, of rational compassion, right? And oriented toward that. And then there's having this, this AGI with that cognitive architecture, you know, grow up in, in, the, in the right mm -hmm. setting. So that yeah. it's getting a pragmatic sense of doing positive things. And that, that, I don't think that's a big conceptual conundrum, but I think it's uh, <clears throat> pulling it off will require a lot of things to be aligned well in terms of who's building and who's deploying and who's who's teaching the AI, which is a human systems problem. And in some ways those are harder than the, the algorithm and the AGI architecture. In in the, the latter part of what you were just uh, expressing, Ben, it made me think about Peter's original concept about the architecture for intelligence in building the framework for it, understanding what is intelligence and with AGI, what would that, that intelligence look like? Peter, would you say that the issue of compassion and empathy are essential to that as far as intelligence is concerned? So compassion and empathy um, to me imply that there's sort of a, a re deep emotional mm -hmm. uh, component, you know, which is sort of physiological component in, in, in humans. So I wouldn't expect um, uh, in fact, an AGI wouldn't have that. I mean, it, you know, it wouldn't start sweating or you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but can it understand what compassion is and why humans have it and what role it plays and how how it fits into you know working with humans and and getting goals achieved? Absolutely. It's kind of what I mentioned in an AGI as far as the human emotions are concerned the non-cognitive, not purely cognitive emotions, uh, that an AGI will be more uh, like, an, like a psychologist who would be detached 
wouldn't be mm. feeling the emotions. Um, I remember when, Peter, you worked with me on a knowledge of meta wisdom, AGI and neural macro sensing, where we talked about the, the AGI on the shoulder that would remind you and give you feedback on what you're, how you're emoting, how you're reacting to things. And I was looking at that paper yesterday. It still stands out as, I think, as a, an important paper because it looks at AGI as being an assistant to us. Um, at, like a best friend or a companion. What I'd like to do is both of you, if you have like if you have a moment, can look in the chat window and if there's any questions that you'd like to respond to so we can include um, all the participants here. There's one here. Let me just toss one out as you're looking. Um, okay, here's a question. Can you create an AGI in an isolated simulation so as to stop in it being able to escape. <laughs> ben, you brought up the simulation argument. So, you know, I'm gonna toss that to you. Yeah, I mean, th this idea has been discussed at, at great length in the transhumanist world. And I would, I would encourage anyone curious about that to look up uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky and a AGI boxing. And he, he went down that pretty far. I mean, if, of course, if you create an AGI, put it in a simulation and never communicated with it, maybe it would never, if the simulation had no bugs, maybe it would never find a way out of that simulation. Maybe that's the situation we're in now. But if you put an AGI in a simulation and then you're trying to talk to it and milk knowledge out of it and in, interact with it, there's, there's a decent argument that if that AGI is smarter than you, you're gonna, it's going to be able to trick you into letting that out of the box. Ah, uh, so now we're coming uh, to some, something else. The Turing some, test. Some, some, yeah, somehow or other. And that, I think Eliezer fleshed that out far enough and went far enough down, down, down those lines to constitute like almost a knockdown argument against that as a, as a total safety guarantee. But that, that doesn't mean this isn't an interesting thing to do as a, as an experimental stratagem and, and anyway right i mean it could yeah, well, be it's boxing and then you knock them out right that's the purpose i think there's a lot of advantages to virtual worlds i mean you can configure and, re and re reconfigure them and certainly before the agi gets to transhuman level intelligence there can be a lot of value and, and and safety to that so i think it can be an interesting approach but there's but while there's we're on no, this path let no me here's there. a question yeah. um and it's, I'm just going to read it to you, Ben. And then, Peter, I'm hoping that you, I see you looking through the chat, so then we'll get to you. Um, it's Ray Kurzweil maintains that we will pass the Alan Turing test. Everyone knows about the Turing test here, I'm sure, by 2029 and teach the singularity by 2045. What do Ben and Peter think? Too early, too late? Your comments, please. I, I, I mean, first of all, I think passing the Turing test as precisely formulated. Mm -hmm is not very interesting. I never thought it was that interesting personally. I could yeah. see why Turing thought it was interesting back when he when he formulated it, right? right. I think given, given what we see with transformer neural nets now, it's highly plausible to make a system that passes the Turing test, which has essentially zero general intelligence. And we just have yeah. so many human conversations in, in, in the database of a company like Google or Facebook that just by, Coverly interpolating patterns recognized in those conversations, we can make we may get something that passes the Turing test well before 2029 with no meaningful AGI behind it. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, it, 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 may, it may be that the Turing test is more elusive for transformers than that, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be too shocked anyway. And that I mean that would be. Interesting, we have very limited commercial value, actually, because I mean, having a system that can kind of bullshit and pretend to be a human, there's already enough humans to bullshit with. I just started thinking about that. We've got enough. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, that's not, <laughs> no. it's not actually it's not actually uh, incredibly useful compared to other things other things you could you could do. So that, there's there's that point. But in terms of the gap between 29 and 45, like. Would it take 16 years to get from human level AGI to a singularity full on? My take is it would only take that long if the AGI itself wanted to take that long. And 
And like I, I think the the path from a human level AGI to a superhuman AGI in a singularity could almost certainly be much faster than that via the AGI rewriting its own code and designing new hardware for itself and so forth. That doesn't need to take 16 years. On, on the other hand, it could be that for two reasons, among maybe others, but two that I'm thinking of, the human level AGI might want to sort of measure the, the pace of its progress. I mean, one reason is maybe it doesn't want its own brain to go berserk. Like if, if I could patch my mind and upgrade my own brain, I might not replace half my brain with a superior algorithm immediately, right? Like I, I kind of like who I am and what I'm doing. I might want to take it a little gradually in making modifications to myself, see how each one felt, then, then make the next one. Like it's, it wouldn't be necessary to upgrade my brain at the maximum technologically achievable speed. The, 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 the other thing is the AGI might actually want to improve itself in some sort of synchrony with, with human minds and human culture. And human minds and culture can only advance so fast. I mean, making that advance over 16 years could enable the AI to grow up with people in a certain way that wouldn't be possible if the AGI made, made that advance in, in, in six months, right? So there, there could be reasons why the AGI itself would throttle its development to a pace slower than the maximum it's almost like, you know, we have biomarkers for aging. We, we check our blood rate, we check our heart rate, we check our weight, our stamina to be aware of and, you know, steering our, our own longevity portfolio life plan. So why not an AGI having a, a algorithmic a marker to test itself on, on how it's developing and growing? It's not anthropomorphizing the AGI. It's giving it a, a sense of intelligence that Peter is, is looking at. Because um, it be makes it more familiar, whether that's delusional or not, I don't know, but it, I like the way it makes it more familiar. So let me turn to Peter. Did you find anything in the chat, Peter, that you'd like to respond to? Um, there was this one comment uh, from Donald Hobson, I think. Okay. Um, an AGI better than humans at everything. Um, well, I, th I think one of the key sort of takeaways is ne a narrow AI will be better at the narrow things that it's optimized for than an AGI general, you know, AGI. But like humans, an AGI is essentially a tool user. So if your AGI, you know, can't be the world Go champion, it can certainly get a program that can play Go really well and, and use that. So it can basically amplify its, its, its own abilities through being a tool user, essentially. So I think that's just a, a comment there. Uh, I posted an article I wrote about the Turing test. Uh, just I, I don't want to spend more time on it. Just to say, the Turing test asked both too much and too little in different ways. So I mean, the Turing test was supposedly already um, um, beaten or achieved um, a few years ago. If it's all only about fooling the judges, then it just comes down to, well, the quality of the judges or the judging process. So if the judging process or judges are, are weak enough, then yes, we can pass a Turing test now. But if what by Ray Kurzweil, if we mean passing the Turing test means actually what Ben described, being able, mm -hmm. you have an AGI that can do all of human cognitive tasks, at least maybe not physical tasks, but cognitive tasks, uh, then we have AGI. And to go from AGI to super intelligence is a tiny step. And it's not going to take any significant amount of time. Uh, you know, even if you had one AGI that's developed, once a technology has been developed and we know how to do it and we have the hardware and the software to do it, uh, it's not going to be the only one in the world. And mm -hmm. it's impossible that it, uh, in, in, in my mind, that all of the AGIs that are built are going to say, hey, let's increment our intelligence only by one IQ point a year well, or something. What, what, what if all the AGIs in the world band together into a, a, a group mind sh sh sharing their intelligence and control with each other and then do make that decision? I don't see how you can say that's impossible. You, you're then making a transition from getting to just about human level intelligence to being able to outfox all of the uh, um, AGI researchers and developers that are actually working on it, and you know well, that will just I, I can I can crank easily up. outfox I can outfox everyone with two thirds my intelligence level. So I, I mean, if 
if if an AGI merely got to 1.5 level human intelligence, then it would seem these AGIs could band together and out outsmart all, all the human researchers, and they can. Well, then it would already uh, they, they at one and a half. It would already. We are talking about. Super, However, click, super. yeah, in, 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 in a way, but I think there's a there there is a possible future where AGIs get a bit above human level so that they can stop humans from destroying themselves and creating mayhem. And then the AGIs, once they're a bit above human level intelligence, they advance their intelligence in a more measured way, rather than say doubling their intelligence every, every, every month. I think that's, that's not impossible. That's a quite rationally conceivable possibility. Yeah, the more likely scenario I see there is that the AGIs would rapidly increase their intelligence because they would know that they would need almost infinite intelligence to be able to control the stupidity of humans. I don't think that's true. I control the stupidity of my dogs without exponentially increasing my intelligence. Like I'm enough, enough smarter and more physically powerful than them that, that I, I don't need to upgrade my intelligence anymore to, to control their, their charming little stupidity. So, but there, I mean, the, the, the thing is that Natasha, I, I mean, as we all know, once, once you get to that level, I mean, whatever all of us are thinking is probably wrong, right? And whatever actually happens is is probably probably not what I, I mean. I've, I've said before, yeah. you imagine imagine a bunch of uh, cave people at the dawn of the invention of language, right? And and they've just figured out how to communicate in sentences and phrases, and and they're sitting around speculating what this shiny new invention of language is is going to lead to, right? And what you know, they, they might, they might, you know, conceive the invention of, of epic poetry or long distance communication networks around the planet. Maybe they weren't going to conceive like Facebook or paraconsistent logic or something, which is just yeah. uh, too few step. It's just conceptually a few natural steps beyond the original development of language, right? But the, but they the, the, they weren't going to see it. And I, I think in the same way, we're at the dawn of something big. We can conjecturally see a few steps out, but we, we can't. We just can't really see what's 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 gonna gonna happen uh, post the the advent of superhuman AGI minds, even mildly superhuman AGI minds. But I think we what we can do is work to make the next step of the human level and mildly superhuman AGI minds at least not like egregiously and transparently stupidly done right like we we, yeah. we at least can make it so that when the agi is human level and moving slightly beyond human level it it likes us and is nice to us and understands us and is working together with us at that stage right i mean at, at least we, we can do that and then would seem that we're biasing the odds in in what would be a positive direction from from our, our current human human perspective I was just looking at the time. I, I, I'm so enthralled that I, I hate to close this out, but we probably should. So being the, the happy moderator here, let me ask you to make a, a closing statement with using your, your keen insights and, and to you know just grasp of what we've discussed, which is only a fraction of what we hope to discuss, but we can meet again. So in, in summarizing for everyone, where we started and how we traveled to our end point in this discussion, how would you sum it up and what would you like to transmit to everyone or just something that you want them to, to, to think about for the, the future of AGI? I'll start with Peter and, and end with Ben, thank you. So what frustrates me, as you say, we've been having these discussions for you know, 20, mm -hmm. 25 years and nanotechnology helped to develop AI or will AI help to develop nanotechnology in terms of anti-aging, in terms of things that are important, important to us. And I'm quite frustrated uh, that we've made so little progress in AGI. And I, I think the, the big reason for that is that people don't pay enough attention to the theoretical aspects to it. You know, as I said, to start off by saying, what does intelligence require? And are we actually building systems? Are we actually solving the problems uh, of building an intelligent system and a thinking machine rather than solving narrow problems 
uh, or beating benchmarks and, and things like that, with, which is a, a huge waste of resources as far as um, getting to AGI is concerned. And we have a whole generation of computer scientists now that don't even know anything other than big data, machine learning, deep learning. And to me, it's not uh, about getting more data. It's not the quantity of data. It's the quality of data. It's how you think about it and how you use it. Just hoping to throw more things at it and that intelligence will somehow emerge means you don't actually understand what intelligence is. You're just basically hoping that will somehow emerge from whatever you're fiddling with. And, and that's very disappointing to me that there are so few people in the world actually systematically working at solving AGI and how deep learning, machine learning has sucked all of the oxygen out of the air in terms of, of achieving AGI. And, you know, AGI could really help us solve the problems that are important to us. And, you know, as Ben uh, alluded to as well, it may well be the case that as far as AI risk is concerned, we may need AGI to save ourselves from ourselves, quite apart from you know, the benefits that AGI can provide in terms of so helping us solve the problems that we have. So I wish we could get people together who actually believe that they have a path to AGI and are willing to objectively discuss it and not do navel gazing like, you know, the thing that frustrates me is philosophy, you pick up philosophy uh, book and like the, the introduction will say, we don't really know what philosophy is, but let's talk about the history of philosophy. Let's talk about this idea and that idea as if we haven't learned anything in 2000 years. And clearly in, in AGI, we should have learned something in the 60 odd years that we've been working on, on, on AI. So I think there are approaches that clearly are inferior that people are spending time on. And as I say, and, and most, of, most of the people working in AI, AGI say, we don't know how to get there. Well, then fine, you know, then, then should the money be going there? Should the effort be going there for people who say, we don't know how to solve this problem? It's a research problem. Shouldn't some uh, effort go into those projects that actually believe they have a path to, and to be critical about, you know, is this a good idea? Are there better ideas? you know, and, and so on. Do we need robotics? Don't we need robotics? Why do we need it? Is language a good path towards it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What are good benchmarks, you know, and what are bad benchmarks towards AGI? So I wish there were more people actually seriously working on AGI and communicating uh, uh, rather than, you know, this sort of, yeah, every, everything is, is about benchmarks and making money and what, what the latest buzzword is. Thank you. Yeah, Peter. part of part of me wishes there were more people. Uh, that the the probably deeper and wiser part of me wishes there were more people on it. The the shallower minded and more competitive part of me is glad there isn't because it increases <laughs> increases the odds that I'm going to be the one to get there first. Right? But from from a human perspective, yeah, it's ridiculous. There's so little emphasis going on AGI you know, human super longevity, nanomolecular as assemblers, uh, brain computer interfacing, all, 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 all these things. And so much more resources going on like online advertising and making useless cheap, cheap plastic junk and making trading systems to extract money from people's pension funds to, to feed the super wealthy. Like it, it's pretty fucking insane how the human species allocates its resources, not, not to mention our lack of attention on, say, solving world hunger and, and other things that are simpler than, than AGI, it would also be tractable. But yeah, to, to su sum up a bit my, myself, Natasha, so I, I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with Peter's statement that the AI field doesn't focus enough on sort of deep theoretical understanding of what is intelligence and how, how could we achieve it. However, I, I think that's only one of the bottlenecks. And I, I think that processing and memory resource has also been a very major blocker in our, in our path to, to AGI. So if, if anyone's curious, if you look on ArcScive, you can see a paper I, I wrote uh, 
number of months ago called the the general theory of general intelligence and this this lays out my thinking about the sort of conceptual issues that Peter was mentioning and tying them in with a bunch of different ma math mathematical theories of GAWA connections and different logic and programming language systems as, as well as neural nets. So I think I've put a lot of work myself into trying to refine the, the theory of AI, but again, having the right theory will only get you so far if the compute and hardware resources are, are not adequate. And often doing the experiments needed to refine a theory into practice takes more resources. Uh, ben, I found it surprising that you think that hardware is a limiting factor in AGI development uh, right now, because that's not my experience at all. I don't think that hardware is a limiting factor right now. Uh, so it's interesting that you've come well, let, to let, different... let me ask Peter if you, you you seem very confident that you have a strong understanding of how to achieve AGI you've been working on it for quite some time with a budget reasonably above zero so what, why didn't you do it yet <laughs> uh, yeah reasonably above zero uh, so we've probably spent a total of maybe 15 million dollars or something on on AGI that's a piddly amount. I mean, that's. Oh, yeah. you, so you, you would, like would you would you and what we have achieved with that, I think, is quite phenomenal. But it clearly, you know, we would not expect to build human level AGI for fifteen million dollars. Well, I I don't have a, a priori expectation on that, but I mean, you 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 feel that you have a solid detailed design worked out and you mostly need more money to pay programmers to finish implementation of that design. Yeah, yeah basically, yeah. That gets exciting. Okay, so <laughs> why don't cool. we yeah. take a, um, whoo, what I would love to do is to work with you both in, in building out an H plus summit on AGI, an incredible uh, discussion, debate and creativity session on it and, and and Peter has a need. He says, we need to get more people. Um, ben, put yourself aside. <laughs> he wants more people. Yeah, we want you to get there first too, Ben. But if we had build out that and invite and intrigue students, people in the field, people aligned to the field. And, and uh, you know, of course, transdisciplinary discourse is so important to this as well. But I think that it's, that will be in 2023. So I We've got some time until then, and we can certainly uh, continue these discussions and, and try to get towards two goals, helping deliver on what Peter is hoping to see and build out, and also what Ben is hoping to see and build out, and where you are both have spent so much time and hours again, going back so many years and discussing this, let's bring this together and make a, a solid statement yes. and stance on this. I mean, so, clearly the, as Peter points out, the amount of money that's gone into AGI development oh. is trivial compared to what's gone into computer vision placement on, 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 on web pages oh. or something, right? So I mean, you, yeah. humanity has put trivial amount of, of money into AGI. The, the number of knowledgeable AI PhDs or software developers who are working or have worked on AGI compared to other things is 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 minuscule. And for that matter, the amount of the world's compute power that's been put into AGI is 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 minuscule also, right? So I mean, relative to all all the pertinent types of, of, of resources, AGI has been very strangely under-resourced relative to the amount of promise, which is clearly clearly there, according to a variety of, of people recognized as, as knowledgeable. And I think this is attributed to two factors. I mean, what, 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 one is humanity is incredibly short-term in its, in its resource allocation, with the, with the exception of maybe the People's Republic of China, where probably it's for the better that the leadership of China doesn't like AGI because they're afraid it would be too hard to control. Right? But uh, I mean, in, in the in the free in the free world, there's a lot of short termism in, in resource allocation, and I think there's a lot of fear of, of of AGI, which also inhibits expenditure of research on it. So I think as as 
AGI gets probably closer and closer. It gets closer and closer to the horizon that the short-termist attitude can, can take it seriously, right? And at, as we flesh out positive visions of an AGI future, more and more so, but we can overcome this you know, delusory alarmism that has spread about, about, about risk, risks of, of AGI. And so I, I think we're entering an era where we're gonna see more resources of you know, human financial and, and computational coming into the AGI field over the next few years to the benefits of projects like Peter, Peter's Mind and, and, and everyone else who's, who's been uh, pushing forward with, with, with uh, limited resources for so long. Well said. Thank you both for being here. Truly enjoyed it. It's informative, but I didn't expect anything less. But let's think about our, our next session and work towards that 2023 event that'll focus expressly on your works and uh, looking at a, a larger community to build off of the original book and the conference at uh, University of Memphis, as well as um, other writings and work with OpenCog and Peter's long interest and work in AGI and, and what maybe he'll um, get to a point where he'll want to show us what he's been working on if it's, if it's possible at that time. Um, to share and also build the, the, a stronger community that you're looking for, Peter. So that would be the the end. And the, goals. the next AGI conference is scheduled for late June in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. So we're, we're hoping there's no World War III breaking out in that yeah. oh, part of the oh. world before then, which may make uh, make travel annoying. But it, it's it will it will be a mixed face to face and 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 online format, so fo folks can participate from. Uh, from from anywhere, so that's uh, another another step in, in pulling all these threads together to an achievement of, of, of AGI. But you can look up a, AGI twenty two St. Petersburg Good. online for pulling that. Great news. Okay, so thank you both. Have a lovely rest of the day. I'll I'll edit this and make it available, and then we'll talk later. I'll also include uh, your books, your projects. Um, in the uh, in the video, and I have the chat, which I'll send out to you, you as well, uh, recording that. So have a lovely rest of the day, and onward. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye bye.